Welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I am glad that you are here and they're checking this podcast out. My thanks to so many people who regularly keep up with what's happening from More to the Story Ministries and this podcast specifically. I, here's why I wonder, if you are kind of a regular listener to this podcast, would you go on to Apple iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and leave a review? You know, occasionally I speak about somewhat controversial things, and some of those things make a few people mad, and I do have a few negative comments on there. So if you're a fan, I wouldn't mind getting a few five-star reviews on there. Forgive me for asking for praise. Maybe you don't. Maybe you can just say, I like this podcast, and you give a five, five-star five review. Or if you subscribe on YouTube, that would be something that would be really helpful. I just want to remind you that this podcast is brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. And one of the listeners to this podcast just wrote an article that I've shared on various channels. It's shared at Wesley Biblical Seminary as well, talking about the growth here and the way God is using this seminary for the church. And so I'd love for you to check that out. Uh, Clay, I think, um, oh, I'm going to get his last name wrong, but Clay, you know who you are. Thanks for writing that great article, for interviewing so much for us. And I particularly appreciate the journalistic integrity that Clay has. A few years ago, he was wanting to write another story, and he realized, you know, I need to research this more. And he's taken time and really looked into various things, so I'm excited there are journalists out there like Clay, and I'm particularly glad, too, that he's a listener to our podcast, to my podcast. Um, I'm I'm thankful, too, for opportunities that come uh, to do this podcast from people like Bill Roberts and Keith Waters from WPO Development. You can find links to them in my show notes. Um, also sign up for my email list at andymillerthethird.com and I'll send you the free tool, five steps to deeper teaching and preaching. So I know it's a lot of stuff as we get started here. I want to share with you all some thoughts that I've had on um, a passage of scripture that I've preached on before, but it's just had a new meaning to me recently. I was invited to the Mississippi State University's Wesley Foundation and th- their Rooted Conference. Reverend Hugh Griffith and his wife, Linda, um, invited me up there, and I got to meet some great students um, who are, you know, some of them are look, looking to be students here at Wesley Biblical Seminary. Some are going into medicine. They have all c- kind of things happening, and I just enjoyed, I haven't been on many big state school campuses, and so being that uh, ecosystem was something that was helpful to me, and I enjoyed it, and, and particularly seeing how God's using um institutions like a Wesley Foundation through the years to help serve the church and to help provide an opportunity for students to be disciple while they're in school. But the, the name of the conference and the main scripture verse that they were using for the conference was rooted. So that gave me an idea that, or kind of like the incentive to want to work through this passage. So I'm going to read it to you and then share some of the thoughts I share with them in more of a, I'm going to say podcasty type of way. So this is uh, Colossians 2 verses six and seven. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Now, a lot of times, people who get, you know, you get my age, I just had a birthday last week, so I'm older, just like everybody else is. I'm in my 40s. How about that? I'm 44. I'll just admit it. I'm 44 now. Well, When you get to be a little bit long in the tooth, you start to look back at older aspects of church culture and you think, oh, if it could just be like it was. But I will say there are some aspects of the older church culture that might not be so bad that we've lost. I grew up in a revivalist tradition that emphasized uh, Sunday school in a really distinct way. We had something called Sunday school opening. Sometimes it was called uh, opening exercises. And the idea was you come together for 10 to 15 minutes before you go to your Sunday school classes. And sometimes it really was opening exercises where you did things like head and shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, like that, that sort of thing. Like you were really getting yourself moving. There would be lucky seats prizes, sword drills, all these things. Now, they've all gone seemingly the way of the dodo, and maybe that's okay. And as somebody who is teaching theology, I'll say there are a few of the songs that we sung in that environment that maybe it's good that we lost them. For instance, now some of you might not know this song, one, two, three, the devil's after me, four, five, six. He's always throwing sticks or bricks, depends on your tradition. Or how about this? Um, I, I grew up singing the song, Oh, the devil is a sly old fox. If I'd catch him, I'd put him in a box. I'd lock the box and throw away the key. 
for all those tricks he played on me, right? Or, you know, I, I like, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. But we, uh, we sang a lot about the devil in these, in these environments. Um, there's that verse, of course, and if the devil doesn't like it, he can sit on and tack, right? Uh, or this little light of mine. It's mine after all. And this little, don't, don't worry. Now, I know there's some good, I know that each of these songs have some little aspect of truth that can work. So please, please don't be offended. Maybe you've already offended people. I'm sorry. Okay. But of course, the idea is you're not going to let Satan, what, what it out, it out. So these are some of those things. Now, with that little word, I am thankful for a few of those songs. For instance, the great song that maybe needs to be contemporized. Maybe we can do this to a guitar accompaniment, but my God is so big, so strong and so mighty. I'm doing the motions for those of you on YouTube. There's nothing my God cannot do. And then goes on, the mountains are his, the valleys are his, the stars are his handiwork too. My God is so, then every, all the kids yell as loud as possible, big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. I think this picture of God is one that lines up with what we see in Colossians, this cosmic Christ. Notice this even the passage that we have today. I'm going to be looking, and if, if you're at a place where you can sit down and look at your Bible, I'll be going from Colossians 2, 6 through 15. But even this opening description is something that's unique. Sometimes these words just roll off our tongue. Jesus Christ is Lord. And notice here it actually says Christ Jesus as Lord. And this is the only place in the New Testament that this formulation is used. But this book has a rich kind of deep Christology. So for instance, if you just go down to verse 9, it says, For in him, get this, in him, the whole fullness of of deity dwells bodily. Notice it uses the present tense, say dwells. And this is a doctrine that's often missed about Jesus's ascension. And it's connected, of course, to Jesus's resurrection and his incarnation for that matter. But in Jesus's ascension to the right hand of the Father, Jesus still has a body. And we talked about this just a few weeks ago on the podcast with Rick Boyd when we went inductively through his slant, his kind of perspective, this contribution he's making to Jesus's sonship in the book of Hebrews, but we are thinking about him as the archegos, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He, in him, in him, the whole deity dwells bodily. And that still is the case right now as Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Then in 10, he, verse 10, he is the head over every body and authority, every power and authority. He's the head of the church. I mean, just think about the reality. He is still leading the church. He is the founder of the church. I often think it's interesting that when people are pretty negative on the church or churchianity, or they kind of like, it's it's an easy, easy punching bag. I just want to say like when, when you're making um, kind of a superior claims about the church and all of its problems, just remember who's the head of it and who's the founder of it. He is the head over every power and authority. And then in 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him, or some versions say, in the cross. And, and this, of course, just fits in with the big picture of what's happening in Colossians as a whole. Of course, I jumped right into this, even though the first few words of, chapter, of verse 6 say, so then, which means we should be connected to what comes before it. But after Paul's greeting and his prayer for this congregation, then we have the beautiful section that starts in chapter 1, verse 15, often called the Christ hymn. I just want to read this. Just think of the big cosmic Christ that's presented in this passage. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of Christ. The, this passage, like Paul in Colossians, presents this cosmic Christ that evades words. I, some of you maybe have heard me tell this story before, but when we were 
when my wife, my family and I were in Tampa, Florida, as a result of like kind of kicking off the Salvation Army's Red Kettle campaign there, we often did that at the Tampa Bay Lightning's Emily Arena. And in the after like the first or second period, um, I went out on the Zamboni and I threw t-shirts out there and they had all the Salvation Army's branding up all over the place. It was this fun kind of festive thing. We had a band playing. But then I went up and I think after the second period, so in between the second and third periods, I always want to call it halftime, but it's not really halftime. Um, they presented a check to me, like the honorary first gift. And I learned that Dave Andrew Chuck and my Canadian followers will know all about these people. I'm not really that good of a hockey fan, but I know he was a good player and he led them to a Stanley Cup. And I learned that as I walked into the stadium that night because there is a bronze statue of Dave Andrew Chuck holding up the Stanley Cup. And I realized that I was going to be meeting that guy tonight as he was going to be making a contribution or on behalf of the Tampa Bay Lightning. So when I um, met him that night, I said, hey, it's so good to meet you. Thanks for your help tonight and that type of thing. I said, I saw your statue on the way in. And he kind of rolled his eyes a little bit and said, yeah, I know. He said, I've, I walk by it every day now that I work for the team. And he said, one of the funny things is, is a lot of times people want to take pictures with me. I thought, well, that's pretty normal. But then he said this interesting thing. He said, but most of the time as I'm walking by, they hand me their camera and they ask me to take a picture of them with my statue. <laughs> and so there they are putting their arms around the statue and he's snapping the picture for them. And I said, do you tell him? He's like, no, I don't want to embarrass him. But I, I think sometimes that that might be what we do with Jesus that we're glad to have him as a statue. Like when in reality, the cosmic, real, living Christ is available to us now, like right in front of us. But after all, if he's a statue, we can control him more. Like he stays where we want. We can take a selfie. Like we have our time with Jesus. You know, Martin Luther says this interesting thing. Key, key to Martin Luther's theology is his doctrine of the ascension. And, and there's some distinction to this that I won't have time to go into here. But one of the things that Martin Luther said is that in Jesus' ascension, he didn't go from here to there, but he went from here to everywhere, to everywhere. Now, some of you who are t- taking systematic theology know that this impacts his doctrine of, of the Lord's Supper. But n- nevertheless, like there's this interesting idea. Think about that Jesus is totally available for us, the cosmic Christ. And Jesus is bigger than any statue or any way that we try to limit him. But this is what's interesting to me, that I find within the tradition that of the people who often listen to my podcast is that we Wesleyans often talk about the way we choose Christ. This is what my friend Chris Lorshofer, Dr. Chris Lorshofer here at WBS, calls evangelical Pelagianism. Um, I, I've been around some situations where um, I, people maybe didn't know that I was listening to their theological conversations. One time I was at a Rotary Club, and on the other side of the round table, <coughs> I heard a, um, a Baptist and a Methodist come together. And they were sharing, and they were trying to like figure out, well, what is it that makes us different? Why do I go here, and what's the difference in our theology? So I was listening closely, and... The, the Methodist said, well, you know, for you Baptist, God chooses you. But for us Methodists, we choose God. Now, I, I could kind of see how they get there. But this is a very dangerous position. Oh, and we use some of the language like this too. Like we choose Christ. We commit to Christ. We accept Christ. Now, you might actually hear, maybe even on this podcast, I've used those words before in my life, and they might come out again every now and then. And certainly, like, we know the heart of what's behind it, but we do need to be careful with our words. I remember hearing a missionary talk about this with the difference that he observed after coming to the United, coming back to the United States after serving overseas for many years. He says, I noticed that you all start use some new, different language about your relationship with Jesus. You talk about committing to Christ. He says, I felt like before I left, we were singing more, I surrender all. I surrender to Christ. Isn't this an interesting thought? That we we often think we put ourselves in control, just like that statue of Jesus. Instead, the cosmic Christ cannot just be accepted. Like, oh, how kind of us to accept him. 
No, like Paul presents the cosmic Christ, and he uses a different word to describe it here in verse 6. What does he say? Just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord. We need, we have a need to receive. And notice even with the, the word receive, R-E part, like a return, sieve, to take hold of. This is something that we don't do. The initiative is God's. This is where the doctrine of provenient grace comes in in a beautiful way to help us understand the nature of this, that God is always the one who makes the first move. We are in a position to receive. It's because of God's initiative. We have the opportunity to receive him. And then Paul uses the concept of being rooted as something connected to the idea of receiving. The, the, the main verb is to receive. It's in the aorist tense. It's like it's a definite task that has accomplished. But then he moves on to say how we are rooted in him, which is an aorist participle, like something that has definitely happened. But then it's interesting to me, it changes to more of a progressive dimension in the next participle. It says, so just as you have received Christ, so walk in him, rooted and built up. So the, the rooted function is something that has definitely happened, but then the built up is something that is building up and establishing the face, faith, just as you were taught. Then uh, that leads to a place of uh, being abounding, of us abounding in thanksgiving. So if we are rooted, that means like something is happening to us. I love this image. Of course, some of these image, images like might cancel out certain aspects of the other, but I find the image of of being rooted helpful. And I, a few weeks ago, I had on the podcast, Roger Helen. And, you know, I, I encourage you to go back and listen to that. Sometimes podcasts that don't have his um, names that people in my audience recognize, like, oh, okay, maybe I'll skip over that one. But I'm telling you, that was a powerful conversation. In his book, I, I found this idea. Actually, my wife found it and she showed me. I want to give full credit here. Um, probably a lot of things in my life, that, that's the case. Uh, but he said this he had this interesting line that I think he got from Howard Hendricks. Who knows where Howard Hendricks got from? But he said, you can either be a pipe or a root as a, as a Christian. Be a pipe or a root. He, and he indicated that a pipe is just a conduit for the water from the, to go to one place to the other. And the pipe isn't changed at all by the water. Instead, what he says is that a root or a tree takes in the water and is transformed by it. And that's really, as I think about what happens for students here at Wesley Biblical Seminary, or your own uh, Bible reading, your own discipleship, like what type of Christian do you want to be? Do you want to be a Christian who takes in, I'm going to just think of my students right now, the assignments I give them, and just gets them done so they can get a grade? Or are you going to allow the opportunity to be in a position to study God's Word, to learn about theology and preaching, to change you? Think about what happens to the root. A root, it takes the water in, in and then all of the nutrients in the ground. And then it's, it's amazing how God made it. And then it takes it up, you know, above the ground, leading to a trunk or a stem. And then it becomes a branch and then a leaf and then fruit. It, it's amazing what happens. But we need to decide if we're going to be a pipe, just a conduit, like let, let's let the water go through us. Or are we really going to be rooted in him? My family and I took a trip through um, from here in Jackson, Mississippi to Arizona. And we stopped at the Petrified Forest in Arizona. And there um, we were, it's a desert-like conditions. But there was this one place where it came up to a rock and I could see this somewhat ugly bush. <laughs> and it had a root that I could see that was bigger than me. And it was like this root was just stretching out as far as it could to get to the water and be connected so that it could have life. So if we're rooted in him, we're not just accepting Jesus and making a little space for him in our lives. What happens is we realize that the cosmic Christ will have no rivals. Notice what it says in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Now, now what's happening in Colossians, in general is referred to as the Colossian heresy, which probably is connected to the way that there was Jewish myths and dreams and eschatological visions, maybe even about the elemental 
elemental functions of the world that make up the world, but certainly like there's a spiritual warfare dimension to what's being mentioned here. But notice too, the emphasis on human tradition, human experience, and not according to Christ. And if you look at this passage, you'll see the repetition, and it's in Greek as well, according to, according to, according to. But you're, we're not doing things according to any of these other areas, to, to philosophy, to empty deceit, to human tradition, elemental spirits, but we are captives according to Christ. I think this is a problem that a lot of, I mean, people in general, but young people might have. Like that they aren't willing to receive Christ Jesus as Lord, to accept this cosmic Christ. Why? Because he will infringe on our freedom. You know, Satra says, um, if there is a God, then I am not free. I am free, therefore there is no God. Uh, our, our choice, our free will isn't bigger than God. The concept that I'm describing here uh, is one that has been helpful to me to think that I just don't make room for Christ, that nothing happens in my life that doesn't come from God. Psalm 16 too, uh, Psalm 16 has been so meaningful to me, in part because um, I realize, I think I've read most of the, I think everything that has been published by Dr. Dennis Kenlaw, and I've noticed that in most of his books, he mentions Psalm 16. And I've been, and not only that, the multiple sermons on that. And he had an idea in his book that was published by Francis Asbury Society, um, Old Testament Theology, that was edited by John Oswald. This idea that is in verse 2, it says, Apart from you, I have no good thing. And he, he describes that as, that reminds us that evil is merely the privation of the good. Just like a, a donut isn't a donut hole is nothing in itself. It's just the absence of a donut. Well, I, I've been like saying these words over and over again. I, I don't know if I fully grasp them all together. Apart from you, I have no good thing. Nothing in my life that is good is anything that, that comes from myself. Instead, it comes from God. It's not my own freedom. It's not my choice. Instead, like it's something that I receive from God. And another verse too that's been meaningful to me lately is Isaiah 26, 12. This is the section that has the, the beautiful verse. Uh, there's a song that I grew up singing that he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. But it, just a few verses later, it says, all that we have accomplished, you have done for us. All that you have accomplished, we have, you have done for us. I mean, it's a wild idea if we get our, our arms around it. There's nothing good that happens in the world that doesn't come from God. Nothing that I've accomplished. I, I've realized, like, I've, I've been reciting the uh, John Wesley Covenant prayer for years. And uh, my friend, who I've had on the podcast many times, Jonathan Powers, he's uh, updated some of the language. And um, I used his version or a version that I found with Seedbed, and I found it to be really helpful. But I decided this year I'm going to do something different. Like, I went back to the older English version of that. And I noticed it says... Um, where I used to read, I am no longer my own, my own but yours. Um, the original language says, I am no longer my own but thine. And as I've said that, I've realized, oh, I've said these words before. Now, this might be show you where I'm a little slow uh, occasionally, but I realize there's a, a hymn by Fanny Crosby that um, often I think of the chorus, draw me nearer, 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 precious Lord. But I realize that there's in this hymn it starts off, and uh, the musician in me, the brass player, who wants to have all the rhythms correct, like a dotted eighth, sixteenth note, I want to make sure I just get it right. And uh, D, 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 D. So you, you might recognize that tune. I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice. All of a sudden I realize, just, just for me, and maybe other people have picked up on this sooner, those first three words are incredibly powerful. I am thine. <laughs> I just need to stop there after that dotted eight sixteenth in the first note. I am thine, O Lord. And maybe if I pray those words and I keep repeating this idea, I'll, I'll be reminded of the cosmic Christ who's inviting me in to a relationship with him. I think this idea and what's happening in th these verses eight and nine is like trying to help them move away from deceptive philosophy, from wrong ideas, really from heresy and the heresy of preferential theology. 
I mean, this concept of receiving Christ moves against the postmodern emphasis that says, you have everything you need inside of you. You establish your own reality. You, oh college student, or oh professor, or pastor, or administrator, you high school student, you're uh, assaulted and bombarded with the lie that says you have nothing to receive. You create your own reality. You establish your own meeting. Instead, like what this passage is saying to me, to us and what Paul is pleading with them. He's saying, instead, ultimate reality is something to be received from someone, by the way, not a mere intellectual assent, assent, but a personal connection to the triune God who's overflowing with love. Ultimate meaning comes from reception or receptivity of God's saving plan and learning of his love for you. So when we receive the gospel, we receive Jesus' sacrifice in our place. We receive the truth of the resurrection. We receive the regenerating and justifying, sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit in our lives now. And we look forward to the day when Jesus will return and put everything right. And we then will see, will see him again. We will receive him. Then our eyes, as the Advent hymn says, then our eyes at last shall see him through his own redeeming blood. Man, like it, this is a picture of a cosmic Christ, and we minimize him. I do. I'm, I'm just saying I, I've done this by putting myself in control. Also, when we were in um, Arizona, we climbed a mountain or a I don't know. We went on a trail that had a great overlook for in, in Prescott, Arizona. It's not Prescott; it's Prescott. And there's a well-known uh, uh, mountain or climb there called uh, outcropping called Thumb Butte, and it, it's in this desert that's you know somewhat you know, like filled with the same type of colors. And we came upon this plant that was really pretty, particularly for the desert. It had a red stalk and it had little apple-like. Um, an apple-like fruit that came from it. And I found this sign that described this plant. It's called the manzanita plant. And I think that means little apple in Spanish. And it described how this plant germinates. Like, so what happens is, or how like it reproduces itself, that when the seeds fall off and are buried in the ground, they will stay in the ground for years. The seeds will stay there, waiting for one thing to happen. You know what it waits for? Waits for? It waits for for a forest fire. And when a forest fire comes by, something awakens in the seed. And somehow in God's botanical economy, those seeds need to die before they can live. With our cosmic Christ, he has no rivals. And somehow, when we deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him and receive him, we become rooted in him. When we die, we actually live. Notice what it says in verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you are also raised with him through faith and the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. So when we die, we live. So being rooted means that we live. And notice, too, there's this interesting idea that like, as he's fighting against this heresy that's hitting the Colossians, he says, don't become captives there. But the implica implication is that we need to be captives of Christ. And verse 15 is interesting. It says, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now, that, that word for triumphing alludes to this idea that would have been in the Greco-Roman world of a conquering king who goes and defeats the enemy. And when he comes back in triumph, he like has all the spoils of war, but the captives come behind him, like come behind him in the procession. And that reminded me, and, and my friend Stan Key, who I think sometimes listens to this podcast, clued me in to another work, and that was um, Scott Haifman's work in 2 Corinthians about this concept of what it means to be a part of Christ's triumphal procession. And the, you might recognize that verse, uh, 2 Corinthians in chapter 2, verse 14. Sometimes it has been translated in a way that 
is a little off, he'll say, but thanks be to God who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession. Um, and it just seems like, okay, so we're victorious with Christ. But Stan helped me see that th- this passage actually misses the idea that the emphasis is the fact that we are the captives of Christ. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession. You see, what happens is we're no longer captives to our own decision. We then put ourselves where we are. Think of this passage, how often it says and how prominent it is in Paul's thinking. We are in him and with him. That he is something beyond measure for us. That when we die to him, we become rooted in him. We then find what it means to live. And what does it mean? As captives, we then enter his triumphal procession. On our way home from a spring break trip to Arizona, which I've talked about already here, my family and I, we were coming, we were on our trip, we were leaving Amarillo and headed back to Jackson, and we decided to try to find a church to attend. And I looked up the Global Methodist Church website. I'm an elder in the Global Methodist Church. I thought, well, that'd be, let's just see if we can find one. And I found one that was pretty much along our path. Well, for whatever reason, um, it took me to the wrong city and the wrong address. And it, something got mixed up on the website. And so I, we landed 10 minutes late. It was like uh, 10 minutes after 11 in front of a house. And it certainly just wasn't a church. It wasn't like a house church or anything. So I felt, felt like, oh, what are we going to do? So we went into our app, and we just looked up a Methodist church. And then it said United Methodist Church of Bridgeport, Port, Bridgeport, Texas. So we decided, okay, we'll just go over there. Well, when we arrived, we saw that the word United had duct tape or electrical tape over the word United. Um, so like, oh, well, maybe that will work. But then we noticed it started at 1030, and now it's like 1111 or 1112. And it's like, do we really want to get in there? go walk in late, but we just made the quick decision to go ahead and walk in, and we came in at the back, and there was a fellowship hall area, and there was a guy, a young man behind a counter who was maybe doing some dishes or something, and I came up to him. We were looking somewhat disheveled uh, from our trip, disheveled, see if I can say that word correctly, and um, I said, are, are we too late to get in there? And he said, uh, no, and then he came around the corner, and he looked at me, and he said, what's going on? And I look back at Abby and the kids. I'm like, I'm sorry, we're late. I, I didn't say anything. I was just like trying to figure out what he was meaning. And he looked at me and said, I know you. I'm a, I'm a student at Wesley Biblical Seminary. And here we are. You have to know, like kind of driving down, you know, Interstate 40, then 287. You don't see very much on those roads. And here we are in a somewhat small town, Bridgeport, Texas. And he's like, yeah, I know you. You're doc-. And I make announcements sometimes so people might know me even if they're not in a class at WBS. And so he took us in then and was excited to see me, sat us down. We caught the last 15 minutes of that service, and we came out. And then we had this opportunity. I, I was able then to watch him engage this congregation. He's an associate pastor there and hug people. Maybe somebody he invited to church had come. And this church has disaffiliated, and I think it's like figuring out who they are. And I heard about that. It was good for my family to— see this student who was talking about all of his classes and how meaningful it's been for him to be a student with us. But it's interesting, like that situation was unique. We, we were in the wrong town, the wrong address, the wrong time, the wrong denomination, yet it was the exact right place. And we look at a passage like this that presents this cosmic Christ. And we might wonder, like, do we really have to die (laughs) do we have to become captives we have to give up our own freedom but i think when we come into contact with the cosmic christ and we say those words from the fanny crosby hymn and the john wesley covenant prayer i am thine i am thine O lord i have heard thy voice and we sing in the chorus draw me nearer 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 to you we put ourselves in a position to receive christ jesus as Lord. And then we might see what Irenaeus says is the full glory of God is to become a fully alive human, a fully alive man. Oh, Jesus, help us. I pray that you will receive this cosmic Christ. And if I can help you in any way, or if you have any questions, or if I could pray with you or pray for you in any particular way, I so appreciate so many people on podcasts who reach out and send me emails or questions time to time. If I miss them, forgive me. I'll do my best to get back in touch with you. Um, But if even what I'm saying here today connects with you and if I can 
help you, I want to do that. Thanks so much for checking out today's podcast. God bless you.